the inaugural edition of Jaipur Bookmark, a platform for publishing professionals from India and around the world, begins today at Nara and Nivas. It will be from 18th to the 20th January. To attend, contact the registration desk at Nara and Nivas. Also, uh, please help us promote the merchandise shops at the festival. Uh, full circle and also we support a lot of NGOs which is Umang, uh, Himjoli, Pratham Books, Radha Swami, Satsang Vyas. So we're delighted to introduce writing Mary Jan. Please welcome uh, Jerry Pinto and Meeta Kapoor. Mic check. I can be heard in Jodhpur. No? The last line? Last bench, can you hear me? Wonderful. Mic check. Oh, yeah. That's good. Wait, Jerry, you don't need a mic ever. Actually, I was thinking, I think you could sit down there and then chat to people and that would be enough. But I think they're filming something or something are there over there. So then they always you know, say... We will be debarred from attending any festival <laughs> from this year onward if we don't follow festival etiquette. Okay, that's I've been on the other side of the fence, I know. Yeah, I put on my kurta also. Kurta is also part of festival etiquette. <laughs> you have to look like a writer, they tell you. No, but we aren't color-coded this time, Jerry. We used to be color-coded all the time. Remember last yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. And I think it is because you have done Deva Sai with me. This can only be the... I'm problem. calling you Jerry Mary Jan. I'm not even saying writing Mary Jan. Areva. Go for it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And it's very nice to see some of you here with us braving the cold. But believe me, Jerry is worth every effort that we put in. And you know, we were in Bhutan together in August. And somebody said Jerry has 10 heads. And I couldn't help laughing because it's like, you know, there's one head that's awake and writing and the other nine are sleeping. <laughs> because he has gone from writing intense poetry to evocative fiction to very informed essays to translations to children's books. So when you're, when you're switching from genre to genre, it requires a certain discipline. So actually, you know and what? No, let me finish my question. I mean, come on. And also... Because there is the demand of writing as a craft and there is the demand of the genre. Yeah. So how are you managing to put on so many hats and dropping them all the time? Uh, you know, uh, yesterday someone from, there's, uh, I was thinking about uh, ABC. You know, how, what a wonderful and magical thing ABC is. And so I decided to write a book on how letters are formed. Okay? So, and how would, like as a child, how would you want letters to be formed? So I sort of started with L, because if you do this much, you've got L. And then you run your pencil like that down the line, and you've got L. So then I thought, oh, L, that's an L. But now if your writing is for children, you can't write O, L, because the parents will then realize that you're cursing. <laughs> so as soon as that happens, as soon as the trap of language is sprung, as soon as the desire to create something starts happening, then the worm starts moving somewhere inside you. Okay? That is the most beautiful part of writing. The moment of the idea. When the idea is there and there's no work yet been done and there's no sense of all the things that must be done, it's just the idea and you in this blank, lovely space. And from that, everything must be created. So then the Tulika people who very sweetly decided to do my ABC book, so my next book will be an ABC book. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, yeah. From it's M you're going to ABC? <laughs> exactly. So, uh, well, my, I'm very excited about doing an ABC book because children are the most terrifying audience. I go to schools where people come up to me and said, you did that book, Talk of the Town. My auntie came to me, gave it to me for my birthday. It is a very boring book. 
So you say, I'm really sorry. Say, oh, the child says, okay, it's all right. And goes on. <laughs> they don't. Then once in a while, I grab this child and I stop them and I say, is it a very boring auntie as well? So they say, yeah, very boring auntie. So I say, well, boring aunties tend to give you boring books. You don't have to write to them, said the person. And then there's also the kind, Altaf Tayarwala's son, God bless him. I was having a really bad month, and Altaf Tayarwala's son, who's like about, you know, five years old, came up to me and said, your jungle book, I loved it. I said, oh, really? I really love your book. So I said, okay. And then I thought I've made some mistake somewhere. Something I have done, Unwittingly, I wrote about a bear maybe, or there was an illustration in the book, or there is a small moment, a set of words that has caught this child and held him and trapped him. It's not me. It's the magic of those words inside there that has caught that child. This is not my fan. I would be, I would be imagining it. This is a fan of the magic of words. And as soon as you begin to see yourself as just an artisan, just one more mason who's whose work is not about, uh, you know, whose work is about putting words in the right order to create the right sense that he or she wants out of, the, out of what you want to do. As soon as that happens, then genre fades and demands fade and all that is left is play, leela. It's like language becomes this mad bu buffet of, of, I don't know, greens and vegetables and you're a salad maker. And your salad can be as joyous and as inventive or as serious and serene or as anything you want, as long as it's a salad. As long, and the wonderful thing about literature is that it doesn't even have to have a recognizable form. Okay? Because right now, if I write something that people say, what is this and all, I, like the Tulika people, they ask me to write an introduction to myself for the back of the book. So I wrote a little poem which I thought children would like. You know, Jerry Pinto is old, his knees won't fold when it is cold. Jerry Pinto's tongue is still young, ding dung. Ding, what's ding dung? That's a bell that says nothing will rhyme after this time. You know, I, it was a little poem like that and they said, oh, very sweet poem, but we have no place for it. <laughs> so I thought, no place for a poem? Surely you jest. But then, what did I do? I slapped it on Facebook. <laughs> I had 316 likes, I feel happy, I close the computer, I come to Jaipur the next day. So, as long as language is, you know, one part of language, Meeta, yeah. we know is functional, it's yeah. agenda driven, it's based on question and answer, it's based on um, make some money, it's all that. But as long as you can keep stretching and playing and bouncing about with language, what better job could you have than being a writer who wants to do lots of stuff? That's actually very inspiring to hear first thing in the morning because we make it sound like it's khel ka maidan <laughs> and you're just dribbling away with a ball and having fun and when you sit down to write it's not fun and you know that yeah. and you do a fantastic job at just making it sound simple. Um, no, when after that there's punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because when, when the final draft comes to you from the publisher and there are 60 red marks on it and you think, oh geez, I don't know how to write English. You, we face it, right? All it's, the time. It's all horrible. The time. You get into a complex and say, oh, yeah. do I know how to write at all? Yeah. But tell me, you moved from, you've spoken about writing for this poetry for children. Uh, in M in the Big Home, with reference to the themes that you've dealt with, what do you have to say about love, about ecstasy, about resignation, about obsession? Because they're all there in that book. And you've, you've actually very masterfully made us confront each one of them in such, with such raw, naked emotion, such unflinching honesty. Oh God, uh, thank you, Meeta. That is <laughs> really sweet of you and wonderful. And you know, there, uh, once I was being interviewed and my sister who, my, you know, everyone has a truth teller in their lives who tells you exactly how stupid you look and, and all rubbish you're wearing and all, the, you know, she was sitting in the audience and then she said, uh, you know, uh, you did okay in that interview, but you have to put on the correct face to receive compliments. 
So I said, what kind of face is that? She said, I don't know. I never get any compliments. So I can't tell you what kind of face you should make, but you have to have a compliment receiving face. So I don't know what to do, so I'm trying this one, OK? So <laughs> she's like, none of it works, actually, because this looks like, yes, 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 you're right, you're right. You know, you got it right. So I, I'm putting on my compliment receiving face. See, I think um, very early on, I, re I realized that if you take yourself seriously, and if you present a serious and grim aspect to the world, you will have to work very hard at keeping that going. You will have to make sure that at every stage in your life, you are doing exactly the right things. Now, I thought, I thought, but that's a lot of work. Instead of which, what if we put on a ludic cast? What if you, no, actually, this is all nonsense. Huh? I don't, I mean, I'm trying to invent an explanation for what this thing, but I think I discovered without thinking about it early that if you laugh at yourself, people laugh with you. And if you make mistakes, then you can always pretend you meant to make the mistake to make them laugh. <laughs> so you get it out easily. So are you trying to that. say that all these very intense emotions in the book? What no, are you no. getting at? No, huh. I'm, all I'm trying to say is that then when you're suddenly, OK, it was actually at the Jaipur Literary Festival that Evan Le Big Whom was born. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so I'd like, to, I'd like to say that and I'd like to thank you, all of you. And you know, you were the one who got me there in the first instance and whatnot. And hey, one big round of applause for Meeta Kapoor. Come on, get and For all the people who make festivals possible, you know, whether it's organizers, volunteers, workers, we just come, come and get all the credit, but there's huge amounts of effort that it takes to bring a festival together or to bring a book together. It takes a village, as they say. We have to talk to 10 heads. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> all, I'm, all I'm saying is um, when uh, the Jaipur, at going home from the Jaipur Literary Festival, I thought, I was 40 at the time. This was seven years ago, I thought. Um, I just met an agent, and that agent had said that, you know, if you ever write a novel, I'd like to, I'd like to take it on. And I thought to myself, well, OK, now the world is listening. You have an agent willing to take a novel on that you haven't written. Go home and write your novel. So I went home and I resigned from all work. And I decided that I would sit down and do nothing else for the next five years except write this novel. And I promised myself I would not read what I had written. I would write just onwards, write forwards. I promised myself I would write a thousand words a day and then I would brush my teeth. So that, that is the work that you are doing. You cannot do anything else. You cannot leave the house until you have finished the work that you are doing. And as soon as those thousand words were over, sometimes it would be at 10 in the morning, sometimes it would be at 4 in the evening, I would then lie on the floor in, only in shorts, I'm sorry if this is too much information, and watch mindless television. <laughs> and do other things, like I would eat chocolate biscuits and, you know, and go out and, and walk dogs in kennels. Because if you should ever be sad, walking a dog in, that, who is in a kennel touches your heart somewhere inside. Maram lagata. But what helped at that point was two things. Because I was dealing with material that I was, I'd hoped all my life um, I had dealt with. And uh, I don't think you deal with an ill mother, a mentally ill mother, you, um, you work with it. You see what you can do. You don't deal with it. And at times, it would become very difficult. So then I would step back from the computer, and I would say to myself, this is not about you. This is about the Mendes family. It's happening to them. This is fiction. And I would say to myself, we can do this if you and I, that is me the writer and me the person who's fueling the writer, and there's some kind of like schizophrenia there, yeah. We can do this if you and I understand that we are, we are trying to do this from a good place, from a green space, a green, moist, mossy space. And after that, we will let it go. We will take the first, the first ever question that I was asked at the first ever reading was by a really good friend who stood up and said, um, do you not feel guilty using your mother's mental illness as material for a commercial enterprise like writing a book? Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, you know, there's, in French, there's a lovely phrase called l'esprit d'escalier, which is 
the, the feeling that you get when you're walking down the staircase out of someone's house after a conversation is over, when you feel, ah, that's the answer I should have made to that question. So Le Spirit de Scalier told me later, I should have said, do you not feel ashamed that you are asking that question? Um, but at that point, I just fumbled my way to the question. And again, that inside Jerry said to the writer Jerry, um, now that you've dealt with this question, you can deal with anything that comes after that. It's done. This one is done. This, what the worst that you want, you expected, someone bitch slapped you in the first time that you came out with your book. It's okay. Now we'll get on with it. So how, uh, you know, trying to write M in the Big Home was this mad um, waltz between me, who lived through much of it, 95% autobiographical, as I say, and 95% fiction, <laughs> and me, who was writing it. So um, what after that is the confrontation is, I think, M and the Big Home as a novel reaches out to people who are ready for it. So, and that makes me extremely happy in a, in a kind of like, I could die now sort of way. I did, I've done my job. I feel in some ways, that was my job. I got that. So given that it is autobiographical, Sorry. and given that, um, you know, you portrayed M as your mom, um, obviously because it is from real life, so it is what it is. Mm. But yet you are coming from a very strong Bollywood tradition. And you know, where the mother's never seen as a person, she's always seen as a, in relation with her children. Correct. So how difficult or how easy was it to keep away from that cliche? <laughs> and also read about, read, read something from M, no? Sure, sure. And they should you all know. know. Uh, the only thing about, I used to go and watch Hindi films where there were these beautiful mothers, you know, like all Nirupa Roy and white saris and whatnot. And they would wander in and they say, you know, I spent the whole day making ghee parathas for you. Apne hato se banai hu main, and whatnot. And my mother would <laughs> sort of, when I came home, wander up and say, um, you want some tea? So I'd say, yeah. She'd say, go make it for both of us. <laughs> Sorry, that's not the way you're supposed to be doing this, playing this role. You're supposed to be saying, how are you? And, you know, please come in, let me press your feet. <laughs> Nothing of the sort. So I'd watch these mothers with awe. And I actually thought other people's mothers are like that. Now here's Neeta Kapoor sitting next to me. Does she look like she's going to ask you? No, she'd probably be, she'd probably feed you very well if you were her kid and, you know, and treat you extremely well. But I don't see that that Bollywood mother is an extrapolation of our desire to convert, to flatten women into certain images of themselves. It's a terrible thing, though, that, though, that mother thing. Because my ma, she says the mother. And there is a great song, no? Ma tu hai puja, ma tu hai. Something, Amjad Khan sings it, actually. Oh. Can you imagine? <laughs> In a film called Ma. <laughs> ma tu hai ma. Yeah, other Mars. <laughs> Not so. So uh, Bollywood was kind of like another dhara. It was another river, a red, brilliant, purple, flowing, multicolored, passionate river that ran past my house. And from time to time, I jumped out of my own black, white, and gray reality, and I swam through this river, and I loved every moment of its improbable, patriarchal, nasty, singing and dancing, three hour long extravaganzas. I loved it. And if they ever made films like they did in the 70s, I'd love Bollywood still. Only now they're all making kachara films. <laughs> Nothing like old Bollywood. Sorry, um, Meeta would like me to read some uh, from here. I'll just read you a very short part, uh, which is, at one point, M, who is the, uh, the woman in uh, this book, it sort of, the book goes between the, the love story between her and the big whom, that is Augustine, and um, between the present where, uh, where there's, you know, everyone's just trying to, to deal with the fact that she's, she's either going to be manic and raging, or she's going to be trying to kill herself. So there are two sorts of, uh, of things. But here is a letter that M wrote to her intended husband just before she's getting married. 
Dear Angelers, I know we have agree agreed to plight our troth, etc. And this may come as a shock, but it is best said now before it is too late and you discover the awful truth for yourself and end up hurt and miserable and believing that you have been cheated. Without further roundaboutation then, into brackets, she takes a long steadying draft of, use of tasteless tea, just so you should know how difficult this is to write. I am not much interested in this whole business of, this whole business of copulation. I love you deeply and an, I enjoy very much our necking and petting. I must say I thought it pretty disgusting that one should open one's mouth, but then I closed my eyes and prayed to Saint Anne. Saint Anne, by the way, is the Roman Catholic saint who is the patron saint of unmarried women. Because any unmarried woman has to only say, Saint Anne, Saint Anne, give me a man, and Saint Anne obliges. <laughs> Saint Anne, and that seemed to work, and now I'm quite accustomed to the taste of it. I may even have developed a liking for it, I suppose, which I might attribute to the magic of love. But from what I have read, and I must say that time three to get married was not very explicit on the subject, and despite all the fierce warnings from the pub pulpit, neither was Alberto Moravia, it seems as if this whole penetration thing might be more fun for you than it is for me. Please read this letter seriously. I can almost imagine you smiling here. I feel warm thinking about your smile, but you must not imagine me smiling. You must imagine that my eyes are meeting yours directly and I am refusing to smile. I am the greatest hypocrisy in the world. So what if I don't take to this thing? How often will you expect it? Will I be within my rights to refuse? I asked Father Fabregard, but he said, that will settle itself by and by, and went all rosy and portugoosy on me. Though why I should ask a celibate man about a woman's rights I beats even me. But who else, I wondered. And that's when I thought, well, there's him to whom he's the most concerned in the affair after all. I will never speak to you again if you mention this letter to me, or if you do not reply in full and with frankness, with all that my mind and spirit can muster, Imelda. There's a reply that he gives you, but to read that, you will have to buy the book. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many of you have read M and the Big Home, but it's full of these precious little nuggets. And underlying is this whole pathos of handling a ill mother, which Jerry has handled with so much delicacy and sensitivity that it's like you, it brings tears to your eyes and it makes you smile at the same time. So he does make you uncomfortable in many more ways. Thank you. Yeah. And that's, I mean, you know, when I'm reading that, I'm uncomfortable in many, more, in many ways as well because at one level I'm just looking at it as words and another level there is memory. And the third level, there is the feeling of that paper under my hand as I opened a letter. Um, and at another level, there is, uh, this is a book and I need to sell it to these people. And all this I must deal with at the same time. And the, which is why, you know, memoirists like uh, Mimi Tao has written a lovely book called The F Word, which is also available on stands and she will be happy to sign for you copies. Um, you know, they have my... Um, Shamelessly plugging. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why do you think I came to this very cold city <laughs> not to sell some books? <laughs> also because I dearly love Gita and all the rest of the crew. Sorry, but I'm saying uh, uh, memoirs, memoirs are even more... Uh, see, at any time, at any point in time, I can drag this veil across myself and say, fiction. And people say, no, it's not fiction. I can say, for non-fiction, it requires everybody to agree it's non-fiction. If I write my version of, of events, everybody who's involved will say, no, that's not the way it happened. For fiction, it requires one person to say that it's fiction, fiction, the author. That's all. After that, it's a contract of faith between you and me, because you make my book happen. My book did not happen until the first person read it and opened it out. And then each person who reads it opens it out further. And together, we co-invent this book. We make this thing in this vejan, this lifeless object, which is just so much paper and print. You and I together, we make this a book, that living enterprise that is the mark of our civilization together. Yeah? So thank you for co-inventing the book, those of you who have read it. 
and others, welcome to the party. Continue to co-invent. <laughs> So I'm going to take you from fiction to non-fiction. You've edited anthologies on Bombay, Goa, and there's one book on cities as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So which means you're a traveler. So when you go to a city, what is it that grabs you? As a traveler, what are you seeking, searching? What kind of stories actually connect with you? That is one. The other part of this is when you and you co-edited these anthologies, which means it can be a huge fight. Always. Right? <laughs> because as it is, editing an anthology is another ball game. Co-editing, that also with another writer, uh, uh, no. So tell us both the, the masala of both the things. Okay. You know, see, as far as uh, co-editing goes, it always starts this way with, you know, you, you're sitting with somebody and you're drinking chai or you're drinking something strong, uh, coffee. And then you're talking about, uh, we need a book like this. And then someone says, we need to do this. and We need to do that. And then you think, Chal, chal, chal. And <laughs> you, you grab that person and you leap off a cliff into this huge library, okay? The library is inside your head. Things you've read, things you've remembered. Then you start talking to other people and saying, you know, I'm doing an anthology of writing on Goa. And they say, of course, you, have, you will have David Tomori in. And you say, sorry, sorry, who? And they say, oh, you haven't read David Tomori. No. Well, uh, how strange, you know? And there's always a big volley person who has read more than you. <laughs> Oh yes, we, that is one reality we're dealing with all the time. <laughs> so then the Bengali person says, and, but of course you will have this in your book. So you say, yeah, yeah, I will have this in my book. <laughs> and then you go quickly and you find that this and what. The other advantage that I have is that my sister is a librarian who works in the biggest library of, in uh, Bombay, which is the Bombay University Library, and she brings home stacks of books when I need them. So, and then you start reading and sorting and then you start fighting because people have certain ideas. And when Bombay Meri Jan was being done with Naresh, Naresh suddenly came up with this idea, we don't need any history. Now enough of these Andre Malros and, and whatever and whatnot. So I said, no, we need to like that. We, I mean, when I'm reading a book, yeah, yeah, he says, you read all kinds of books, you know, but what is the current kind of book that, I say, no, 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 I don't care what the current kind of book is. This is the kind of book I want to do. And he says, right, uh, well, you know, maybe you should reconsider this. Naresh is very, adult. I am kind of like, and I don't want to do this book, you do this book, you do whatever kind of book you want, I, I, I'm not talking to you ever again in my life, and dirty fellow you are, and I knew the first time I saw you, I knew you were a condescending asshole. And uh, then about 30 seconds later, I think, oh God, he's my friend, and he's, he's a nice guy, and I ring up and I say, sorry, sorry, and he says, what about? Because he's very adult and mature, and he will take badla, he will take revenge very much later, <laughs> when it is cold and what what friends have. But, you know, you eventually come to the conclusion, then you say, Naresh, the next book we'll do, na? next book we'll do, we'll do only new writing about Bombay and all this mill land and all, na? we'll do with that. He says, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you come to some, like, I mean, you, see, the only thing, Meeta, about me is that all the people I have worked with are still my friends. <laughs> so. That's not difficult. <laughs> not with you. Actually, you know, uh, we live in different cities. So. <laughs> might be a little easier. When, you know, it's the simple, straightforward thing. You know, you meet someone every day and then the small irritations also start surfacing. It's like the people you love most are the people who will irritate you and anger you most. And I'm, I irritate and anger people almost effortlessly. Also, sometimes I think because I'm not editing at all, I need to start editing. You know? Like, I went up to Neeta and first thing I said was, where are the dingle dangles on the back of your blouse? Because every time I meet Neeta, there's another lovely pair of dingle dangles on the back of her blouse. And it's just lovely to walk behind her. Stop and walk. embarrassing so, <laughs> so I was very disappointed this was a sadharan brown blouse. You see the criteria of doing moderating sessions <laughs> with people. What is the world coming to? I don't know. No, but... Um, edit, have, edit. Karli, huh? Haan, please, so whoever's recording, snip, snip. Yeah. Um, you did a book on Helen mm. and one on Leela. So there is this investigator, there is the journalist, and then there is the need to, with reporting fact and analyzing, balancing creative expression, making it readable for us. So with these two books, how did they come about? Because I'm sure there are fascinating stories which yeah. were not told in the books. Oh, yeah. You know, We'd I'm rather hear those. Yeah, okay. I'll tell you the Leela story, my favorite Leela story, okay? 
Now, Leela Naidu was one of the five most beautiful women in the world, Vogue declared in 1962, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there she was drifting around Bombay, and everyone was falling in love with her, including a young captain in the in the Tata Airlines. At that time, it was called Tata Airlines. So one day, this young captain rings her up and says, "Leela, come, let's. I've got a, a quick hop. We're going to Pune, you know, to Pune, cross the Ghats. We'll have tea at the club and come back in the evening." So Leela says, "Oh, of course, yeah." And now in the 1950s, you must remember, you could smoke anywhere, including in the cockpit of a plane, <laughs> including in theaters also. It's like all the, uh, apparently in the last seats of all the, all the uh, South Bombay theaters, all the ladies of the night would sit with their long cigarette holders, blowing smoke rings at young men and what was. Seems like another, another life. And when Leela learned to tango, the last test was between her thigh and the male thigh who was dancing with her, there was a gramophone record kept. You had to dance the entire tango without letting that gramophone record wow. slip. Yeah. So imagine the intensity of the contact between those two thighs. And Leela Naidu's thigh. Woo! <laughs> anyway. Uh, so Leela and this young man are in the cockpit, and behind them are, is one is a director of the Tatas who has been flown to Pune and you know to see a work, uh, some work or whatever. And uh, you know, Leela and Hari, uh, sorry, uh, the captain light up their cigarettes and then the captain's driving, I mean, sort of piloting the plane and says, okay, Leela, if you don't say you're going to marry me, I'm going to smash us into the ghats and we're all going to die. Uh, so Leela says, oh, darling, don't be silly. <laughs> but, and he goes, right up to the ghats, off. And as he goes, whoosh, off, the poor director in the back seat vomits. <laughs> because he... <laughs> He only expected to be taken across to Pune. He didn't expect to suddenly be like, you know, the death threats to be in the air. So when they get off the plane, this uh, captain says to the director, you should apologize. You know, you vomited and some of it hit us. The director said, I apologize to you. You are sacked. You are fired. And then the two of them both discovered they didn't have any money because, you know, they thought they were flying back. So they had to come back by bus or something. Now, after, at the end of writing, we put in this story and... It seemed like a lovely story. I mean, one of the many people who fell in love with Leela Naidu. Um, we started getting phone calls towards the end of the book. There were two kinds of phone calls. One kind was, was saying, I'm in your book now. I'm a good friend now. You put my name in now. You told that story about us now. And the other kind of was saying, I'm not in your book now. <laughs> See, I was very young then now. I didn't have all those things now. Who remembers now? <laughs> So we constantly were like looking at one story and saying, oh dear, someone's getting really offended and throwing them out, taking out another story, you know, popping that out. And eventually it came down to the kind of book it became was because eventually Leela was very dear to me. She was a lovely, beautiful, and very um, bruised young, uh, woman when I, when I met her. But she was gracious to the end, you know. She, the last time I met her, she was sitting up in, um, in bed, she'd been bedridden for a few months, and the, you know, the counterpane was Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck because some grandchild had come and was there. And at the same time, she was talking, but she still managed to make you feel like she was offering you the gift of her beauty as an incidental thing, that this was something that just happened. It was, I don't know, it was like the inside of, of, of a shell. She was like the inside of a shell in, in the way you met her. She made you feel like that. That was very, very suggestive, this beauty. And it was offered very subtly. And I remember thinking how lovely it is just to be sitting here. And then 30 seconds later, she was irritating me again, <laughs> hugely, by, because she would never make a correction in the book. She would say things like, on page 36 of your lovely, lovely book, I'd say, what? She'd say, oh, I couldn't possibly correct anything. You'd say, no, no, there's a mistake. Oh, how can you say it's a mistake? You'd say, Leela, tell me. So she said, okay, if you insist, promise me you won't get angry. So you say, okay. I checked my passport and I did not go to France and meet Renoir in 1956, but in oh. 1955. So you say, okay, I'll change that. No, no, only if you must. I'm saying, oh, it's a fact, we will change it. See, you're getting angry now. I knew you'd get angry. <laughs> but it still was wonderful. And, you know, I remember uh, we'd 
I, towards the end of the book, I said, Leela, we need photographs. So, darling, it'll take a little time. So I said, no, no, we have time, come on, how long will it take? And she said, um, not much. And she waved at a, a couple of cupboards, and I opened the cupboards. <laughs> the whole cupboard was filled with photographs. And everyone had photographed her, every single person. And so, you know, we could not put in the Richard Abaddon picture because money, you know, hmm. this. So it's like we, it took about nine days to sort the photographs out, <laughs> the amount of photographs that there were. But all this for me is meat and bread. I love it because it's suddenly like you're walking through histories. And in this country, we suffer from terminal amnesia, from constant forgetting, from constant neglect. Constantly. So that's Sophia where I teach at the postgraduate course. I ask everybody, all my students my, uh, in media, to do a 5,000 word essay on their mothers. This is transformative often because very often people don't know much about their mothers. They don't know, uh, you know, like which college she studied in. Did she have a boyfriend when she was in college? Did she want to do something like uh, history but was forced to do something like philosophy? Did she finish her degree? What did she get in her degree? What did she, where was her first job? And I insist that it be a stereoscopic perspective, that they, insist they interview her family, her friends, her cousins, and the transformation is radical. And this year, for the first time, one of my first students in the first batches, her daughter came back, has come to the course, and now she's writing about her mother. And I can't recognize that student of mine in what the daughter is writing. But already two generations have been fixed. Already some traces, some records of women's lives are being fixed, are being set down. And so this, natch, this year we decided to do Lives of the Women. So we brought out a book which, you know, um, uh, on, the, on four lives of in Bombay women, cultural people, cultural personalities. And this is, I think, the struggle of the word. The struggle of the word is the battle against forgetting. Words will hold, will save your memories. And so just before we were coming in, Meeta will tell you, I was saying, Meeta, I hope you're keeping notes. I know. I yeah, know. because notes, diaries, they will record a person you are losing in this second. That person who's in that past seconds. Keep records, make diaries. Which is why when people ask me about blogs, I say, love them. I love blogs. However meaningless, Facebook, even Facebook will record a certain kind of person that you are and hold amnesia back. You may look at your Facebook posts 10 years later and think, oh my God, was I really thinking that? Oh, will Doesn't they keep matter. them 10 years later? <laughs> I don't, I, no, if Zuckerberg wants us to, <laughs> or he might take all of them away and just say, yeah. I'm doing the Facebook posts book. Or whatever. But I'm saying, write, record, hold on. We all... I was walking around Shivaji Park with Joe Sacco, and he asked me, what, what language is that? And I said, it's Devanagari, and it was in Hindi, so I read it out. Then he pointed to another one, and he said, um, what is that? It seems like the same language, but it's another language. So I said, that's Gujarati, and I read it out. Because I, if you live in Bombay, you can read some Gujarati. And I taught mathematics to Gujarati students, so I started learning Gujarati sort of little bits and pieces, marshu and all I can say. And then after that, I mean, I told him that I can read Urdu, and he said, how wonderful it is to be able to experience language in four scripts. And I thought, yeah, I can, but do I? So that day I decided that every day I would read English, Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati every day. Just because it's, and if you can do this in two languages or three languages, please do, please, you know, Indian, we Indians are so gifted. So we've been thrown this huge bunch of languages. Take out your 500 rupee note and look at the number of scripts that are on it. There are some 11 scripts on that 500 rupee note. All that belong in this country. All of them. There are 52 living scripts. 11 are here. Wow. And we can read in these languages. Many of us can read in two or three languages. And we read only in one. I'm going to Why? cut you short Why? here. Sorry, sorry. Because you need to then yeah. talk about your translation okay. and read. This. I want him to read two passages from okay, Cobalt Blue. Yeah, okay. We've got five minutes. Am I okay? Yeah. Okay. So just read because Listen, they must I'm understand sorry. the magic of translation. You. You're dealing with languages sure. and you went ahead and did this translation, okay. which, which I think has wowed all of us. Okay, so this is, uh, it's a two-part story. There's a young man and a young woman, both of whom tell the story of their love affair with the same man. 
And at the heart of this novel, which is full of beautiful words, is a deep, horrible, complex silence. You know, a silence that is very common in Indian families, where we can talk about everything to our parents, but we cannot talk about our hearts. We cannot talk about our loves. We cannot talk about sex. So, and this, I think, is what makes so much child sex abuse rampant, because children cannot go home and say, I was at my mathematics class, and my teacher reached into my underwear. You can't say that to your, to your parent. And when you can't, you are telling child sex abusers, Jao, tum azad ho. go, you're free, do what you want to the children, they will say nothing. So this grim silence at the heart of the book, where brother and sister cannot say to each other, I love this man. This is what gives it its complexity and what gives it its tension, its huge tension at some point. And this is Tanay, who is a young gay man who is being, who is walking through and, uh, you know, walking through the, through the courtyard. Um, do you mind if I do a little, sorry, I'll just, can I walk up? To yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Sorry, see, I was reading this book and there's a moment where the young man says, don't walk fast like a girl. So I was thinking, don't walk fast like a girl. Men don't walk fast. And then I realized that this is it. Sort of, you know. You have a cord this, you have a mic. Sorry, is the watch. Sorry. You have a mic, <laughs> a wire. <laughs> so this is the, the quick gay walk that he's being warned against. And he's being told, walk like this, like a man, like Rambo. Yeah? Okay. One of, on one of those days, I was taking the wooden ice cream bucket out of the kitchen when Sunil, Ram Kaka's son, hit me on the legs. I almost dropped the bucket. I sat down to rub my legs. Sunil was always exercising. He could talk about nothing other than his body and his exercises. He shouted, walk properly, keep your legs apart and walk straight. Why do you mince along like a woman? Then he took me into the backyard, which was set with large square tiles. He forced me to spread my legs apart and place my feet in separate tiles. Then he made me walk. For about an hour, he sat on Baba's scooter and rewrote my gait. Tanya, walk straight, don't trip about like a girl, keep those shoulders up, push that chest out. From then on, right up to this day, I fear that I walk funny. In other words, I walk like a woman. I learned that men do not do certain things. They do not wet their dry lips by running their tongues over them. Then immediately I'm stopped and thinking, how do men dry their lips then? How do men wet their dry lips? How do I dry, wet my dry lips? Ah, hmm. That's how men do it. This is how women, women. do it. <laughs> really? Don't be silly, I kept thinking. But this is what masculinity can be constructed as. They don't trot after their mothers into the kitchen. Really? I was trotting after my mother into the kitchen all the time, but hoping to eat something. They don't use face powder, okay? They don't sit on a motorbike behind the woman. They don't need mirrors in the rooms where they are changing their clothes. On trips, they might go behind a tree. They don't even need an enclosed space to take a shit. They can do it in the open. They shouldn't be afraid of other people seeing their bodies. If there's only one bathroom, they can bathe in the open. When caned in class, they do not cry. They do not buy tamarind from the lady who sells it on the road, and they certainly do not sit by her side and eat it. It's a passage about, the mas about how masculinity is constructed, which is why I was interested in it. And here is Anuja, who is another, uh, Lovely creation, Sachin's lovely creation, because she's completely unlike anything I've ever read before. Anuja has just had her first sexual encounter. That was the time I saw a male body nude for the first time. Anubhav's hands roamed my shoulders and breasts, gaining new ground at a victor's pace. In my turn, I tasted his entire body, and we satisfied our curiosity exploring, investigating, fulfilling old, some old fantasies. I don't think I felt so much guilt as physical pain. And when that sort of subsided, a feeling of victory, of achievement, and went to sleep. Anubhav got I let myself out of the house. The rain-washed city seemed fresh and beautiful. By evening, my heart had stopped thundering. When I telephoned him, he asked me over. I wanted to sit and chat with him in the old way, 
But he drew me into his arms as soon as I walked in and said, I love you. I drew away to stand by the window. His eyes seemed to fill with tears, but I felt it was time to speak clearly and honestly. What happened between us was lovely. I enjoyed it, but I only let it happen because I wanted the physical experience. I don't think I'm in love with you. I think I might prove a difficult person to love. Let's just assume that bit is over. It was just as I feared. He walked out, banging doors as he went. Notice that they are in his house. So he walked out of his own house, leaving her there. A little surprised, I suppose. I had to leave then, and I walked home, trying to sort out with what I felt. I had changed the rules. I had acquired a new vibe. The only problem was I couldn't share this with anybody. Anubhav's rage lasted a month. Then he said, I'll wait for you. You're free to do as I please, as you please, I said. But I didn't, I did want him back, but only as a friend. Why aren't things easy? Or do we just make them difficult? Thank you. I think with that, thank you, Jay. With that, we'll open the, I'm sure some of you have questions. Any questions? Yeah, uh, this book is uh, originally in Marathi. It is Sachin Kundalkar's uh, debut novel. He wrote it when he was some 21 or something terrifying like that. The fact, I think, is that he was 21 that gives it such immediacy and power. Uh, it is the kind of book that you would not be able to write at 42. You can write it at 21 because you can take amazing risks at 21. Most of them don't come off. I have to say this. I have to say this because I see many young people and I feel often young people are in a hurry to publish. I think be in a hurry to write. Don't be in a hurry to publish. Publishing will come when it comes. It must come organically. It must come as growth. It must not be forced. You can't, you know, you can't force ripen fruit and expect them to taste the same way. So wait. Let, you know, let it come to you. Let it happen. I don't know, it sounds all very, actually because eventually you have to send that novel out and you have to ask and whatnot. But I don't know how, I, I can't, I wish I were a sage. I wish I could say things like, this is how you do it and this is how it will work. I don't know how it will work for you. But know this, if you're writing, I, you have my best wishes. Yeah? Yeah. I don't think it's on. Oh, it's oh, it okay. is? Okay. Um, I loved M and the Big Home, and I want to know how many drafts you might have gone through. Um, <laughs> because it's stripped bare, it's so clean. Thank you so much. You know, eventually, uh, this draft that I started on when I was 40, when I, I quit all work and decided to only write the book, the draft that I started on when I was 40 was draft 25 of many drafts before. Um, but those, and then after that came this last draft. That started out as a handwritten thing. I had started writing by hand. And I wrote 750,000 words, which is three times the size of War and Peace. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then I, I gave myself three months or six months away from it. I did not look at it for six months because I wanted it to become someone else's work. I wanted to get some sense of distance, distance from it. Yeah. Then I started reading it again, and it was bilge really bad and halfway through like reading and weeping okay i'm absolutely heartbroken now because i've i've thrown my all i've said chal ye le i'm betting my all on the i'm betting my house on this okay that's basically where i'd come from so every day i would read it and weep at how bad it was i stumbled on one passage that i thought okay i can put my name to this this i can put my name to and then i thought stop crying shit face at least there's a short story here. Ek short story nikla to wo bhi kafi hai. That's enough. Take it. So it's all snot running down my nose and I'm wiping it off. And unfortunately, I blow my nose on my banyan. So I'm really filthy. <laughs> and, but only at home, not outside. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> uh, I'm sitting there really depressed and disappointed when another passage appears that looks okay. And a third passage. And so I start with great trepidation, tearing those out of the, this thing and putting them in a separate file. And then the file looks thick, but handwriting is very deceptive. So it only comes up to about 30,000 words when I'm finished. Out of 750,000 words of writing, I've got about 30,000 words. At, at that point, I'm just 
you know, I don't know whether I should be elated or I should be desperate, but I show it to Ravi Singh, who's my uh, editor and, and publisher and, you know, really very strong. This thing, and he says, you've got something here, work on. And just like, you know, again, I'm start, I start weeping. I weep very easily. Like, you know, Lassie comes home and I start crying mad. So I'm easy like that. But I just spent that whole day weeping because I thought, okay, these five years have been saved. And I started working from that. And then that was the last draft. And when I finished it, there was one last test. Because uh, a book must not hurt someone you love. Hmm. Which is why we took out from what Leela, when Leela said, I don't want this in the book. We took it out because I didn't want to hurt anyone she loved. So I showed it to my sister because it was about us. It was about our family also while being fiction. And I held my breath and I said, okay. And But I said to myself, if you are ready to give it up and to say, if my sister does not want this book out, I will not have it out. I will bury it. It's over. If you can come to that space, clean white space where it's okay, that's okay. You just give it up. Nothing. Okay. I came to that space and felt better for a moment. Then I, my sister finished reading it and said, I said, what do you think? And she said, too many commas. <laughs> so I took that to mean that, you know, my sister was okay with it and I just sent it off. And then after that, you know, Halla Gulla Pachala. And here I have a Jaipur Literary Festival. Yay. Ah, yeah, and you got the, lit uh, the Hindu prize for it. <laughs> yes, exactly. The Hindu Lit for Life, which, you know, if you're invited to as a festival, you must go for because they give you a car to yourself. Full day and five star hotel. And Jerry, everybody's Jerry, in the same. Jerry. <laughs> no, no, you get to go, like, you can go to Mahavlapuram and come back also. They don't say anything. So just, you know, invited to the Hindu Literary Festival, accept, like, clear your schedule. <laughs> I was very impressed. And she's behind also. She and Rachna, both of whom, like, you know, just feast for the eyes every time you walk past. Sorry, sorry. Must not say like that. <laughs> I have to say, put on my compliment receiving <laughs> face and say, thank you, Jerry. Yeah. But we will still look for more questions. Over there, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, so it was Shekhov who, when asked uh, why he hasn't published a novel, said that he hadn't lived enough, right? And we all know how Shekhov is. So when did you realize that you'd lived enough to actually start even thinking about publishing this? You just said it was like 25 drafts in that you started writing the 26th of the final draft at 40. Right? So when did you, I mean, what re uh, resulted in that realization that you'd lived enough and had enough distance from it all? You're a very bright boy. Yeah. I mean, when a question starts with a literary quote, then you notice a bright boy in the audience. <laughs> very nice. But I'm not joking. I'm saying I'm, I'm really trying to uh, think your question through. Because you know the horrible answer to that, what's your name? Abhishek. The horrible answer to that, Abhishek, is that I thought I was ready to write this novel at the age of 16. That's when I started my first draft. And now I think about it, and, I, and at 16, you know, the, the terribilitas of your emotions, the intensity of an adolescent angst is so powerful that you are sure that you have lived enough. You're completely, I mean, you think, who understands this rage? Who understands this helplessness? How can people not see that I'm a fully functional adult? How can people not see that I'm responsible for myself? Even though I just took drugs and drove your car, that doesn't matter. That was one mistake I made. That doesn't, that's not everything. You know, you're full, you're, your body seems ready, your mind seems ready, and no one's letting you do anything you want to do. You're angry, you're hurt, you're raging, everything. And I was a very, very, very difficult um, young person. <laughs> Very difficult. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I like that quote that you. I mean, I hadn't read it before, so that's a lovely quote, and I will keep it in mind, and I will use it at another festival where I will say, <laughs> as Chekhov <laughs> said, you know, <laughs> and sound very smart. But um, I don't see. I think if you asked anyone in this audience, have you lived enough? They'd say, "Arey, yar, tu meri zindagi jile ta, to tere ko pata chalta, dard kya hota hai." <laughs> You would know if you lived my life what pain really means. Everyone feels this because that's the individuality of pain. It is, there's nothing like it in the world, nothing so magnificent as what I have been through. This is true and it is actually true, which is why novels will continue because the individuality of, of humanity is what keeps the novel going. It's when we try to write what seems like a novel, that's when it fails, the novel fails. It's when you, you say, 
I have a story. It is blocked like anybody else's story. And it is me who will tell it. That's when I think it works. I think we have time for one more question. And I'm around here and I'm very happy yeah, to Jerry chat will to be, anybody. Will be, I don't know, whenever, wherever they escort him for book signing, he'll be available so you can... Just come up and chat. I'm very happy to chat. So, okay. Jerry, um, you spoke very well about the pains that you went through in trying to get this book published, the, the one that Kalpana was referring to. So what advice would you give to the spouse of a budding writer who is going through similar kinds of... I would say divorce the... <laughs> you know, writer. because the lady who asked the question was his wife. <laughs> you just walked right into it, Jerry. What are you doing? And she happens to be my author. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> okay. Understand this. If you are friends with a writer, if you are brother to a writer, sister to a writer, child to a writer, spouse to a writer, you are raw material. <laughs> you get angry and they're looking at you and thinking, huh, what did she say? How did she say that? Let me listen to the rhythms of her. <laughs> huh, okay, okay. And she's getting all her words wrong. She meant intensity, she said immensity, but if I do that, then the critics will say, no, no, he doesn't know English, so I shouldn't do that. Sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, you're right. And then they're all pretending on the, but inside they're just a <laughs> 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 so, the writer is the, is the fly on the wall that you thought yourself to be. We are there constantly. And I, I sit in buses and listen to people. And once I remember there was one woman walking past me in a restaurant and she said to this younger woman, I think you should really do it again. And I stopped <laughs> what I was doing and thought, do what again? <laughs> Old lady telling young lady, do it again. <laughs> so then I couldn't bear it, so I put down my fork and knife and I ran out of the door, to, out of the restaurant, and I said, sorry, what should she do again? <laughs> and that woman said, no, I, she doesn't like Banoffee pie, so I thought she should try it again. Oh. So I said, oh, okay, Banoffee pie. And then the woman said, but who are you to ask? <laughs> so I said, no, no, I am just your, I am just your well-wisher. <laughs> Hurtled okay. back into the restaurant. And, I huh? think that... If I have told you the story, it is because I have rejected it from a book. Otherwise, I'm not giving you anything that I'm going to write. <laughs> That's smart. Very smart. I think with that, we'll have to thank Jerry for...